May I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week we began to read from the letter to the church in Galatia. We're going to be reading through it for the next few weeks in the lectionary as we move forward into the summer. I don't know if you noticed last week that the reading is, shows that Paul is writing a different kind of letter than he writes in his other letters. Normally when Paul writes a letter to one of the churches, he goes on for some sentences about the faith that he finds in that place, how he gives thanks for the ministry that they have, and how he boasts about their works and their faith to the other churches that he is visiting as he makes his way around the Mediterranean basin. But last week, he turned almost immediately to what has gone wrong with you. And next, I think it's next week, you hear my favorite line in the whole of the letter to the Galatians. You stupid Galatians. <laughs> they somehow missed the thread. Paul has been with them, teaching them what Jesus had taught him, teaching them the core meaning of what the gospel is. But within a few years of his absence, reports are coming to him that they completely lost track of what the gospel means. They forgot what it was that Paul taught. And Paul is just flummoxed by this. And he tries to remind them in this letter by saying, I told you the gospel, it is of divine origin. If anyone is teaching you a gospel that is different than what I taught you, you must Depart from them because they are not from God. He never actually says so what the gospel is. Which is frustrating. Because I'd like to be able to turn to that part of his passage and see exactly what he means by it. He instead talks at length about this idea that he is asking them to recognize that God has saved them not because of who they are or what they are doing but because that's God's nature. And in this lesson, particularly in this uh, letter, he draws a distinction that we have picked up within the Protestant tradition, at least in the last 500 years or so, of the distinction between working and earning your salvation and being given your salvation because you believe that Jesus is Lord. We've gone from works righteousness to a righteousness based in faith. But that's always kind of bothered me. You know, if you think about it, if I do, I guess maybe because I was a scientist, and people would say, what did you do today at work? And I would say, well, I went to the office, I'm stealing the line from the big bank here, if you recognize the sitcom. I went to the office today, and I thought about stuff, and then I came home. <laughs> that all you did? Well, I wrote some of it down. <laughs> I got paid to think about stuff. I got paid to write some of it down, and if it was interesting enough, I would publish it, and people would say, good job, and ask me where my next publication was coming. What I thought was my work. It always struck me that if we try to make a distinction between doing good for people and thinking the right kind of thought about God, and one got you into heaven and the other didn't. They were both sort of things that you did. They were both acts of your will. And I never could quite understand why active faith was being were disparaged and a special thinking faith was being commended. It's almost like you just have to know the right phrase, Jesus is Lord. And then you get into heaven. And it leads us to a confusion about what the gospel really is. And I don't know that that language makes sense to us anymore. If I were to just stop right now and say, what's the gospel, by the way? How would you respond? If someone saw you in the elevator, and you had a couple of floors to ride with them, and they said, I hear you go to St. Luke's, 
probably know what the gospel is. I've been trying to figure out what the gospel message is. Could you tell me what the gospel is? Do you have your elevator speech ready? Listen, I've asked this question to theologians. Don't feel bad. I've asked it to bishops, I've asked it to clergy, I put it out on the internet, and we get into giant arguments about it. Nobody really has the definitive elevator pitch version of what the gospel is. And I think it's because we're still struggling to understand the subtle message that Paul is telling us. That the gospel is something different than what he had been taught as a child. Something different than what he had strived for in his passion to live into his Judaism with the belief that, that was going to save him. And maybe that's the, the key. In fact, I think that is the key. That Paul is trying to warn us that we are not saved because we're holier than other people. We're not holier than other people by things we do. And we're not holier than other people because of things we think. We're just not holier than other people. And the mistake we often make is to think we are. And that's why God likes us better. And we're going to heaven. And the gospel becomes a matter of reducing our conversation to what do we have to do to get into heaven. I had a man once come to me when I was teaching in Arizona, and he asked me at the end of the class, he said, no, 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 that was Gene at the time, Gene nicely, I'm an old man. I don't have a lot of time to make a mistake. What do I need to do exactly to get into heaven? <laughs> I said, I don't think you need to do anything. That's God's job. He was not happy with me. <laughs> he wanted to know because he was really worried. And I kind of get that. He really wanted to know what it was that he had to do to get to heaven because he wanted to do that. To be sure that he was going to be saved. But that's the point. We don't get ourselves into heaven by what we do or by what we think or Whatever. That's God's job to us. And the mistake we make when we forget that gospel, that God loves us, full stop. God has saved us, full stop. That's all you have to worry about. The mistake we make is that we tend to make the gospel ours, or our groups, and we miss the point. We've forgotten the real teaching that Paul gave to the Look, you see this so clearly in the Old Testament lesson. You see it so clearly in the Gospel lesson. They're really mere images, aren't they? Probably not by accident. So much of what Jesus does in his life is a retelling of the stories of the Old Testament, sometimes with a twist, and it has a different response at the end, sometimes just to drive home the point of this is who Jesus is. We have the story in the Old Testament about Elijah and the widow, and the widow's son. That God had sent a famine on the land, on the promised land, and people were dying. They were starving. And God says to the prophet, you need to leave here. There is no salvation for you in the promised land or among the chosen people. If you're going to be fed, you have to leave and go to the Gentiles. And it is living among the Gentiles that I will find a way to feed you. He goes and he meets this woman. It's such a sad moment. She's gathering up sticks and she's getting ready to go home and make a small fire and mix together the remaining little bit of oil she has and, and the ground meal, the flour that she has, and make a small cake. And she and her son are going to have their last meal together. And then having run out of food, they're going to die. <clears throat> And the prophet says, you're not going to die. God has sent me to you. I am coming with you. And we're going to use this little bag of meal that you have and this flagon of oil that you have, and it's not going to run out for as long as I stay with you. And for the years that he lived with them, they had food enough for the three of them. God had sent the prophet to the Gentiles. And it was in the presence of the Gentiles 
that God did the miracle that kept him alive while the chosen people continued to struggle. It wasn't that they were holier and God was giving them something. It was that God was trying to make a point to us all. That God is God of us all. Whether you are in the chosen group or not, depending how you understand this. When a young man dies, it's the prophet Elijah who saves the Gentile son in obviously a prefigurement of what Jesus does on the cross. And it's exactly that story that we hear echoed as Jesus, walking in the regions of the Gentiles, sees the widow of Nain coming out of the city with her dead son, weeping, because everything she had has been taken from her. Her chance of living, her chance of life, her resources, her house, her money, all gone when her son dies. And Jesus has compassion, raises the son to new life. He is doing the same kinds of things that Elijah has done. And, and next week, by the way, John the Baptist is going to send messengers to Jesus and say, are you the one we were expecting? Are you the Messiah? The one who has come, the chosen one? And Jesus says, do not give a straight answer? What do you see? The dead are raised. The blind are given their sight. He's referring back to these, the miracle of this week and the miracle of the healing of the centurion of the slave last week. Both of which were healings that were outside the proper boundaries of, of the chosen people. God is making it very clear to us that we are not saved by the things we do or think or even who we are. We're saved because God saves us. That's what God does. God is salvation. We don't have to worry about making God love us anymore. God already loves us with a passion and a power that brings life into death. There is no in or out group. There's just life. There's just God's love. It's amazing how we don't get ourselves tied up in knots by missing the point. Look, if it gets to the point where we're thinking you have to think the right things about God, why do you think there's so many Protestant denominations? What are we fighting about? Well, they don't think exactly the right way about the third step of salvation. As we do. And their canon on salvation history is slightly different than ours, so we can't go to church with them. Right? Not really convincing the world that we love one another. And it's not bringing us together in the presence of the living God. We have to sort of drop this need to find who's in and who's out. Every time you hear people using language, that tries to create a majority that is organized in opposition to a minority. Whether it's in the political world, or the religious world, in your family, with your friends, you miss the gospel. Because the gospel says we are all children of God. God loves us and is bringing us all, all of God's children, into life. Whether we are the ones who are beginning to understand the gospel, or the ones who have gotten confused about it. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he doesn't say, you're out, you missed up, you failed the test, you are out, and God will not save you. He says, it might be a little harder for you to understand the full implications, but you're still saved. You can't lose your salvation, because it's not something you have. It's something God is giving you. Like the life to the son of the widow in Zarephath the wife, the son, of the widow in name. God just does. Because God is just love. And that love has no boundaries. And that love cannot be denied. At its core, that's our gospel. That's why we gather. This is all a way of reminding ourselves week in and week out about that fundamental message. Because, kind of like the Galatians, every now and then we lose the thread. And we think we know the gospel. We 
start thinking about who's in and who's out. Who's holy and who's not holy. Who God likes and who God doesn't like. And then Paul writes us a letter. It says, remember the gospel that I taught you in the beginning. Do not lose that bread. Because that will take you and all of you into the place of life 